I recently set out to investigate whether it was possible to beat Crash Bandicoot 2 if you replaced every crate in the game with a nitro crate. You know, the lively green boxes that explode instantly when you touch them. And something that a few people said after watching that was, I wonder if you could do that with any other Crash games. I'd already ruled out the first game, I was familiar enough with it to know that you'd never be able to get more than a couple of levels into it, and after tinkering a bit with some of the other games in the series, it does seem like you wouldn't be able to get very far with most of them. I'm not going to spoil the final outcome of the Crash 2 challenge, in case you haven't seen it, but since that was a 35 minute video, I think it's safe to say that I didn't come up against anything completely insurmountable as close to the start of the game as you would with some of these. I think there is still some interesting stuff to look into with Nitro Crates in the other games, but when it comes to the exact challenge that I attempted last time, beating the Insane Trilogy version of Crash Bandicoot 2, I think the obvious place to try it next is in the Insane Trilogy version of Crash Bandicoot 3, and that is what most people wanted to see next anyway. So, what do you think? Can you beat Crash Bandicoot if every crate is a nitro? Now if you've played Crash 3, I'm sure you'll be thinking about the superpowers that you unlock by beating each of the bosses in the game, because one or more of those extra abilities may make it slightly easier to deal with Nitro crates. Slightly. But they're only available in the traditional platforming levels, and they'll only be helpful if I can get far enough in the game to access them. And since I want to be consistent and I'm sticking with the remake rather than the PS1 version, I can't just use a glitch to have all the powers unlocked from the start of the game. Of course, the superpowers aren't the only things you could use in this game to blow up nitros without getting hurt. If you have an Aku Aku mask following you around, you can take an extra hit and survive hazards that would normally kill you. And when I attempted this with Crash 2, there were a few points when I used Aku Aku masks to help me get past nitros that I couldn't find any way to avoid touching. However, I had this rule that the only masks I would be using were ones that were actual items that you can pick up in the levels, and not additional masks that you're given to help you when you die several times in the same place. And I will be following that same rule this time around. But something I didn't realise until, well, now, is that those loose masks that aren't confined to Akiraku Aku boxes that you can occasionally find in the first two games are only in the first two games. There is nowhere in Crash 3 where you can pick up a mask that's not inside a crate. So if I encounter anything like I did in Crash 2, where I decided that having a mask was the only way to make it past a certain point, I'm fucked. One final thing before I get started, just like last time, I have uploaded the mod that I'll be playing here for you to try for yourself, if you want to, link in the description. But here we are, at the start of the game, in the Time Twister, which is a bit different to the warp room in Crash 2. Instead of each group of five levels being on a separate floor, you can see all of those hub areas from the very beginning. These gates won't unlock until you've beaten the boss of the previous area, but the levels being laid out like this may become relevant later on. Coco's also available from the start this time, so I'm going to switch to her and head into level 1. Toad Village offers a nice, easy start to the challenge. Unfortunately, you can't herd chickens into nitros to blow them up like you can into insanity, but you really don't need to worry about the nitros in this level. Just like with Crash 2, going into the bonus rounds is the only way to set checkpoints now that the checkpoint crates are out of the picture. So it's always a good idea to go into them, even if there's not really anything to collect in there anymore. But getting this first crystal is not an issue. Level 2, however, under pressure, is a bit more annoying. I've never enjoyed these swimming levels very much. Initially, it does seem like you can probably just swim right over any nitros you come across, but it does get more awkward as you progress. Thankfully though, the swimming levels provide one of the only ways to get extra hit points, since Aku Aku's not around. This jet thing gives you a bit of extra protection, and it lets you fire torpedoes that can kill enemies, and more importantly, 
you just need to make sure you avoid getting hit by anything so you keep the jet for long enough to blast through these crates that completely block the path. I mean, this would already be the end of the challenge if it wasn't for the jet, so definitely try to keep it for as long as you can. It's just a shame really that you can't take it with you to other levels. I was a bit worried about these China levels after the experience I had with the animal riding in the last game, but Orient Express, at least, isn't too bad. This jump you need to do to get the crystal is probably the trickiest part of this one, but I did discover something interesting about these levels. The second one of these I actually found to be one of the hardest levels in this version of the game, so I died quite a lot there and started getting free masks. In the spirit of the challenge, whenever that happened in this playthrough, I deliberately lost those masks to obstacles I'd already got past without them. But what I learned is that if you run into any nitros in this level while you have a mask, well, the game doesn't really know how to handle that because there are never normally nitros in these levels. Most of the time, adding nitros to places where they shouldn't be doesn't break anything, but you might sometimes spot some eccentricities. Level four is, of course, Bony Ard. I found the chase sections in this game much harder than any in Crash 2. I'm not sure if it's because of the camera or the placement of the boxes or both, but it feels like you barely have any time to react to avoid these nitros. It's actually the second prehistoric level that's really difficult now, but I still found that the chases in Crash 3 were much more about learning the route and getting the muscle memory for it than they ever were in Crash 2. Luckily though, the crystal's on a side-scrolling section, so you're not in danger of running straight past it and missing it. Making Waves is the first jet ski level. For the most part, these levels are fine. They're the most open parts of the game, so the nitros are usually very easy to avoid. Hot Coco, the secret jet ski level, might be more problematic, but it's not required to beat the game, so I don't have to worry about trying to replicate the trick I've used there before to cheat the time trial. But basically, the nitros here are just like the bombs, except they're easier to dodge because they don't move around. And with five crystals collected, we can fight the first boss. Tiny Tiger. Now the bosses are more significant than they were last time because, as I said, this is how you unlock the superpowers. And once you beat Tiny, bestowed upon you is the supercharged body slam. It doesn't normally feel like it's that helpful very often. I mean, in the next game, it was relegated to something you have to go through an optional secret area to unlock. Good luck doing that if you're playing the Nitro version. But doing this challenge has given me a new appreciation for the supercharged body slam. The game describes it as a more powerful belly flop. What's actually improved is the range of the attack. You'll see the benefits of that if you test it out vaguely near the next crates you come across. Yeah, that's right. The first superpower you unlock allows you to destroy Nitros without getting caught in the blast. It's not totally game breaking, there are places where it doesn't help, but, well, this certainly would have made Crash 2 a lot easier, wouldn't it? But level 6, Gee Whiz, is another medieval level, so they kept things pretty simple, and you can get through it without ever needing to destroy any crates anyway. And then the next level is Hang 'em High. Yeah, this level does not start in a very friendly way, but fortunately, the bizarre way that you spawn into Crash 3 levels means the game puts you in a more sensible starting position after you die. Those crates that killed me are normally arrow crates, but it's easy enough to reach this bouncy awning without them. These hanging sections are great examples of how the super slam isn't always going to be helpful, because it's impossible to use it here. But in this level, there's an enemy you can use to get rid of the only nitros that do get in the way. So for a level with such an alarming start, it's actually pretty straightforward. Hog Ride is the first of the bike levels. At first glance, it might look like having nitros here wouldn't make any difference. You're on the open road, so they are pretty easy to miss, but you have to win the race to beat this level, which means you'll need to hit a few boost pads, and they can often send you straight into some grades. Also, this is another type of level where you would never normally see any nitros. Nothing weird happens if you hit them, they will just kill you. And if you give yourself a mask in this level, which isn't supposed to be possible, you can take a hit without anything breaking. Although getting three masks here does mean having to finish the race on foot. But now I'm getting sidetracked. Getting killed by the nitros doesn't cause any issues per se, but normally you wouldn't be getting killed by anything in these levels. The other racers just give you a bump, and if you fall into any holes, Aku Aku will rescue you. 
If you do manage to die, you will respawn just fine. But if you die enough times that you run out of lives, the game will crash. Because you're never expected to die here, you shouldn't ever be able to get a game over in this level. So if you do, the game literally is just over. It will close. So that's something you need to be aware of, especially in the later motorbike levels. This one's the easiest, so it's not too bad. Tomb Time is up next, and it's the first place where the Super Body Slam can really help you out. You can jump over this wall, but it's easier and more fun to just do this. This level was also the first time I needed to do some trickier platforming. And this time it's not to get past any nitros, it's because there are a few moving platforms in this level that are normally activated by switch crates, which are no longer switch crates. So this is a pretty long jump to be doing before you have most of the superpowers, but it is possible. And once you grab the crystal and are just about at the end of the level, there's some more platforms that you can't activate. So this last jump is another long one, but you can make it. And this is Midnight Run. Remember what I said about the second China level? This is one place where the nitros do make things significantly harder. And the body slam isn't gonna help you here. This is one of the levels that took me the longest to beat, but there aren't really any tricks to it and there isn't a lot to say about it. It's just about learning when to jump and when to dodge. And just remember that if you do get any masks in this level, they won't be very helpful with the nitros. But once you get the crystal, that is number 10. And that's enough to fight the second boss, Dingo Dial. After the ordeal that is Midnight Run, I feel no guilt whatsoever about cheating in this fight. And beating Dingo Dial will give you the second superpower, the double jump. It won't help you to destroy any nitros, but it does make difficult jumps less difficult, so it is still very useful in this challenge. The first level of Warp Room 3 is Dino Might. It's pleasant enough to begin with, this is where you meet Baby T, and like the jet in the swimming levels, he gives you an extra hit point, and he can jump high enough to make avoiding all the nitros in this first section a walk in the park. And then you can use a body slam to reach the crystal, and another to break one of these nitros up ahead. But this part is a bit awkward. I am reasonably sure you can't just hop over this without hitting all of these above you. If you get lucky and you can blow this nitro up right as it hops in the air, it'll catch all of these above it and make this next bit easier. But if that doesn't happen, which is more likely, then the difficulty here is you need to body slam close enough to this nitro to blow it up but far enough away from this nitro that you don't get caught in its blast when that one explodes, and far enough away from this whole stack here that you don't just jump up into it when you do the body slam. So I have a feeling that this may be the most precise body slam you need to do in the game. If there's any way to glitch Baby T past the point where you let him go, like there is in the PS1 version, that would let you damage boost through all this, but as far as I know, that isn't possible. But I would never want to deliberately hurt Baby T anyway, he's definitely my favourite of the rideable animals. I mean, if you could use him in Crash 2 instead of fucking Polar, then that game would have been a lot less painful. So it's either do quite a risky and pretty much pixel perfect body slam, or do what I did originally before I realised that there was a sweet spot where it's safe to body slam. If you just stand here for a short while, and if you react at just the right moment when the opportunity comes up, because it is pretty tight, you can do this. Yeah, you'd better believe I finally found a way to use that exploding phone as a legitimate strategy. If you don't know what just happened, this is a really strange thing they did with Coco in this game, where one of her idle animations produces a real explosion that can actually destroy stuff in the level when you're not even playing. I was so happy that I found somewhere you could use this. I really wanted to find a place for it in Crash 2, but I couldn't. Now that I know you can use a body slam here, I would probably recommend doing that instead, but this is the more fun option, I think. Anyway, the final part of this level is another Stegosaurus chase. And this is what I was talking about earlier. It's very blind, you have so little time to react, it's, it's much harder than any of the chase sections in the previous game. But you will get used to it once you've played it enough times. And then that is crystal number 11 sorted. Level 12 is Deep Trouble, or Swimming, my favourite but at least you get the jet from the very start this time. It's actually very lucky that in both of the swimming levels, the only time there are crates that it's impossible to avoid breaking, they give you a projectile launcher. 
just before you reach them. There are some tight spots later on where there's some nitros in areas that are already quite crowded with hazards, but you can just about weave through them if you're careful. I did find this level quite hard, especially in the parts where you don't have the jet, but it is doable. So that's 12 crystals done. And that means with the next one, we'll pass the halfway point. When I did this with Crash 2, it was level 13 when things got a bit more complicated, but I'm not superstitious enough to think it's going to happen again. So this is high time. It starts off similarly to the previous Arabian level, where there are normally arrow crates that you have to manage without now, but the double jump makes light work of that. When you get to this hanging section, you can use this guy to clear out these nitros. Then this part's a bit dodgy. You can't spin that scorpion into these crates and you don't have room to do a body slam on this platform without getting killed. But as long as you jump away from the blast just before it gets you, you are able to use the bazooka here to blow these up. Oh, oh, that's, that's not right, is it? I haven't unlocked the bazooka yet, have I? Um, uh, you, you know what, I'll, I'll tell you what's happened here. It's, it's the bloody time twister playing up and, and giving us a glimpse of the future. I, I think we need to go back in time a bit to, to see how we got here. Sorry about that. So actually, yeah, you, you shouldn't have the bazooka when you get to this level. You need to beat the fourth boss to unlock it and I've only fought two so far. So what are your options here if you don't have the bazooka? Well, as I said, the body slam's no good. You have even less space here than in Dynamite. And before you ask, the phone trick isn't gonna work here either. So what else? Can you get on top of the monkey bars like you can in the PS1 version? Nope. Invisible wall. Can you jump over to the bonus area that's right in front of this section? Nope. Invisible wall. Also, the bonus round is impossible to complete anyway. Can you use that glitch that sometimes works in Crash 2 to continue hanging in the air after leaving the monkey bars? I don't think so. Not with the invisible walls. Is there any way to glitch these bouncy awnings to send you flying up high enough that you might be able to land beyond that bit that I'm stuck on? Well, I, I found evidence to suggest that it could be possible, but I wasn't able to replicate that to test it. So I think I understand now why these crates are arranged in the shape that they're in. There is one more method that I have tried to use to blow these up without needing the bazooka. And this is something that I didn't stumble upon until after I'd already finished my attempt at this game. And I was just coming back here for some extra footage later on. So that's why you won't see me using this technique again for any other levels. But take a look at what I discovered it's possible to do at the start of this level. Oh. Okay, apparently you can just spin nitros to destroy them without getting hurt, as long as you can jump away fast enough. I think you can jump onto a nitro and very quickly spin at the same time as you jump off it again, and it will explode and you can survive that, but I don't think I have the time to pull that off. This seems considerably easier to do. Like, I did it accidentally the first time because this wall just happens to be the perfect distance away from these crates, that it will just work if you're up against the wall and you do a random slide spin jump here. And it's similar with these next boxes. You can use the low wall here as a guide to position yourself to safely blow these up with the same method. Once you get a feel for this, it's actually pretty easy to do it consistently, even without a wall to help you. So this might appear to be game over for the nitros. Surely you're unstoppable once you got the hang of this. But the way you avoid getting hurt with this is by jumping out of range of the blast. So I think you can only do this if the nitro you're spinning against doesn't have another one on top of it. Otherwise you won't get high enough to avoid getting hit. And it also means that it isn't gonna work if there's a low ceiling that prevents you from jumping very high. I tried to use it here, but I don't think it will work. And ultimately, it seems like the only advantage that move might have over the body slam is that it's faster. The body slam will still work in more places than this. It would actually be more useful in Crash 2, where you don't have the super body slam. And I found that there is one place where I used a mask when I did this challenge with Crash 2, where this strap does work. So at least, I found some use for it, but unfortunately, I don't think it'll help with this level. I tried everything I could think of here, but I just couldn't get past these. Now, if you watched my Crash 2 Nitro video, you may well be looking at this stack of Nitros and wondering why I haven't considered the possibility 
that they might occasionally glitch into each other while they're hopping up and down in a way that lets you get past. Well, actually, that definitely can happen. And in fact, I saw it happen before I ever even started to explore any of these other ridiculous options that I've been going through. The first time I played this level, with all the nitros in it, I got up to this point, realized it might be a problem, and went to write a couple of notes about things I could try here to get around it while the game was still running. And almost immediately, certainly within the first minute or two of me seeing this for the first time, those three crates just kind of collapsed into each other, leaving a gap plenty big enough to get through. I was recording any footage at the time and I did die as soon as I switched back to the game but I managed to grab a quick screenshot to show that it had happened. So if this happened after just a couple of minutes why bother investigating so many alternative methods for this part? Well because that first time I saw it is still the only time I've seen it. Just like when I was trying to take advantage of the erratic nature of the nitro crates in Crash 2, I left the game running here for hours and hours waiting for it to happen again. But even when I left the level open overnight, it still never did. So yes, it definitely can happen, but it only happened for me once on my first reconnaissance run of the game. I still needed to find a way past this on my actual playthrough. So that is the reason why I did end up using the bazooka to blow these up eventually. To answer the question of how I was able to do that though, we'll actually need to leave this level alone for a while and come back to it later. So the level after high time is Road Crash. Like the first bike level, you want to run over enough boost pads that you can get into the lead, but avoid the ones that will send you directly into nitros. It's definitely harder this time, but at least there's no monkey bars. And that is level 14 beaten, but only my 13th crystal collected, since I haven't managed high time yet. We can worry about the consequences of that in a minute. Before that, it's double header. The final medieval level, unlike some of the other level themes, like the prehistoric levels and the China levels, there's no real increase in difficulty from one medieval level to the next. Everything's avoidable and Crystal 14 is an easy one. But what now? We know that I'm planning to use the bazooka to beat high time, but I won't be able to use it until I've beaten the fourth boss. But I can't even fight the third boss and get any further in the game until I have 15 crystals. Luckily, they don't need to be the first 15 crystals in the game. As long as your total is 15, the next boss fight will open and beating him will get you into the next warp room. So, can you somehow get an extra crystal here? Well, even if the extra item glitch from the PS1 game worked in this version, it would require the use of an arrow crate, so... Yeah, that's not going to happen. And the new DLC level they made for this remake doesn't contain any crystals, just gems. So that means getting a 15th crystal is going to involve breaking into a level that you're not supposed to be able to play yet. And this is why I pointed out that you can see every hub area from the start of the game. There is a way to bypass some of these gates and access the levels behind them while they're still locked. If you were speed running the game, then you might want to use that to do something like skip the fourth boss because it's quite a long and tedious fight compared to the others. I don't want to skip that boss because I'm planning to use the bazooka that you unlock by beating him, but I can still use the same idea to get access to these final levels early, which will give me more options for collecting crystals than I currently have open to me. I think there are a few ways to do this glitch. I don't care about speed in this situation, so I've just been doing what works for me. If you head back over here, where I unlocked Coco at the start of the game, you have the option to leave her here again. I don't know why that's an option, but it's helpful for this that it is. The button to open the Coco menu here normally lets you crouch and crawl and slide. So if you time it just right, it's possible to open the menu and slide away from here at the same time with the same button press. You can tell that doing that confuses the game because the camera stops working and if you jump you can hear the confirmation sound from the menu still plays because the game isn't sure whether that menu's open or not. If you switch to Coco now the camera gets fixed and then what you do is head over to this platform. This is how you access the DLC level future tense. You need to jump on here but you have to be aware of what's happening with that invisible menu. When you walk forward and back you're also changing which option you have selected. 
The top option is supposed to leave Coco behind and prevent you from switching to her, and the bottom option that's supposed to close the menu won't do anything, I guess, because you've already closed it. If you leave Coco behind at this point, then the rest of the glitch won't work properly, so you need to make sure that you're not moving forwards as you jump, or you'll select yes, but you can jump on while moving back instead. And in this area, you simply walk off the platform and hop back on, still avoiding pressing yes, and once the screen goes black, that's when you press up and X. If you get it right, then you'll switch back to Crash off screen and you lose the option to play as Coco, but you still get that confirmation sound when you jump, as if that menu's still open. The game is gonna stay broken now until you get into a level. Coco is especially broken. If you unlock her again from the laptop, then when you switch to her now, she's gained the ability to clip into certain walls. Conveniently, that includes this one right next to the entrance to the final warp room. Now in this state, Coco can't jump. Once you're inside the wall, you can swap back to Crash and he still can, so you can get onto this walkway. When you hit this invisible wall here, Coco can carry on uninterrupted. And then here we are in warp room 5 with only 14 crystals instead of the 20 you're supposed to have when you get here. You still need all 25 crystals to access the final boss and beat the game. This doesn't change that, but if you feel like this is still cheating then maybe you can take some comfort in knowing that any levels you attempt here you'll have to get through without having all of the superpowers you're supposed to have by now. At this point you should have the bazooka but I don't. So in that sense, going into these levels early does make them harder. And okay, yeah, there are some vehicle levels here which aren't affected at all by the powers, but you know, if it helps you sleep at night, you can do a platforming level instead, such as level 21, Gone Tomorrow. Even though you'd normally have both the Death Tornado Spin and the Fruit Bazooka when you reach this level, you can beat it without either. These big robot guys, you can attack like any other enemy or just jump around them. Coco's back to normal now, by the way, in case you were worried. She's able to jump again, so you can avoid all the nitros without too much trouble. There is something a bit odd that you'll see a couple of times in this level. There appear to be a few iron crates that haven't been turned into nitros, but these are actually just scenery models, the same as all the buildings and stuff. I did check the PS1 version too, and even there, these aren't actually crates. So that's why they aren't affected by the mod. Maybe you would need the bazooka for this if all of these were now nitros. As it is, you can get through with a well-positioned body slam. And when you finish the level, you'll be rewarded with crystal number 15 at last. While you're here, you may be tempted to try these other levels. As I said, there are vehicle levels here, so those aren't going to be made any easier if you wait until you have the other superpowers before you do them. But it's quite important that if you do things the way I have, if you have 15 crystals now, but that doesn't include high time, you need to go back to the third warp room and fight the third boss now before you get any more crystals. Helpfully, this gate that's still locked will let you through in this direction. And over in warp room Three, it doesn't look like you can access the boss yet, but if you just go into a level and then exit it, you will now see the button that opens the boss fight. I think if the 15th crystal you get is from this warp room, so double header or something, the button will appear when it should, but it doesn't really matter. What's important is the way that the buttons for the normal levels here all disappear once the boss becomes available is the reason why you need to fight this one, Entropy, at exactly 15 crystals. If you did hang around in the fifth warp room to collect some more, the game would assume that you must already have fought Entropy, so it would make the five levels in this warp room available again. But if you haven't fought him yet, then this boss button will stay here in the middle instead of moving over to the side like it should do. That means it will now be overlapping with the button for level 13, and as far as I can tell, that makes it impossible to press it and open the portal for the boss fight. So, however many crystals you had, the fourth warp room would stay locked forever. And I don't think you can clip into that one with glitched Coco. So, now that I have my 15 crystals, I'm going to take on Entropy right now. I did take an unconventional route to get here, but once I beat him, I unlock the Death Tornado Spin. 
This one lets you glide a bit and makes it possible to jump further than you could before. I don't think you can use that to help with the high time problem. So I'm going to continue to not worry about that level and go into warp room 4 now that I finally can. Level 16 is Sphinxinator. If there were any more of those long jumps from the last Egypt level here, having the double jump and the death tornado now would make them a lot easier, but there aren't. There are a couple of places where being able to glide does speed things along, but the body slam continues to prove itself as the most useful superpower. Bye Bye Blimps is the first flying level. Obviously the nitros are very easy to avoid here, and you have a machine gun, so you can destroy any that you do come close to hitting. Or, because you have a health bar, you can fly straight into the nitros without dying. You'll just lose a bit of health. Well, you will do with some of them anyway, but ordinarily, the crates attached to these balloons replenish some of your health when you break them. And there's no such thing as a health crate in this game. They're just normal Wumper crates, and the health boost is a separate thing. That means you still get the health increase when you destroy any Nitro that's normally a health crate, as it were, even if you fly head on into them. So after spending the whole game trying to avoid Nitro crates, in this level, smashing into some of them is actually beneficial. But of course, the point of this level is to destroy the blimps. And when you do, you get the crystal. Then it's another jet ski level. Tell no tales. Like the last one, it's pretty open, so it's mostly fine. I was worried when I saw this, but you can just about squeeze past this nitro. Future Frenzy is supposed to be the first future level that you play, but I guess it lives up to its name more when it's not. There are some places you'll need to body slam through some nitros, but the trickiest parts involve these green sort of turbine things. When you step onto these, you'll automatically go into a death tornado spin and be launched up in the air, which is normally pretty fun, but if you let that happen here, you won't be able to clear all of these boxes, but you can jump over them if you just do it yourself. Or if you do a body slam right into this launcher, it will eject you out of harm's way as soon as you land. So you can safely blow up the nitros if you prefer. There's another one of these at the end of the level, and this one is designed to have you smashing through all three of these crates as you glide down, which we really don't want to do. So again, it's better to just ignore it and glide over there on your own. As long as you don't double jump, you should miss the nitros. Level 20 is Tomb Wader. This has always been one of my favourites, and the nitros do make it more challenging. The biggest difference is that you lose the crates you can normally stand on when the water rises, where you wait around for a bit for it to drain out again before you continue. So in those parts, you have to be fast and get through each of them in a single flooding cycle. It feels like trying to do the time trial, but before you're able to sprint, and with loads of extra hazards to avoid. But there's nothing impossible here, and I had a lot of fun with this one. It's a nice way to finish off Walk room 4. And yes, that is crystal number 20, which means it's time to go up against the fourth boss, Engine. As discussed, you can do what I did to access the final levels early to skip this fight, but I do want to fight him, because once I beat him, there it is, the Fruit Bazooka, the ultimate weapon in the fight against the Nitro Crates. I reckon the reason why they're always trembling like that is because they know that they'll never be safe as long as this thing's out there. And I know exactly which nitros are going to be getting a taste of this first. I was actually surprised when I found that you can shoot these without being killed, but aiming at the top one gives you just about enough time to get away before the one you're standing next to explodes. It is frustrating that I know those crates can get out of the way and I just couldn't get it to happen again after that first time, but I think it would have been kind of boring if that was how I got past them. And come on, skipping ahead to the end of the game to beat this level does tie into the time travel theme quite nicely. There are more monkey bars later on, and they so easily could have put crates up here that it's impossible to get past without touching. But they didn't. The whole of the rest of the level is no problem at all. So in the end, level 13 gave me the 21st crystal. From here on out, and back onto the intended route through the game. So it's level 22 next. Orange Asphalt yet another bike level. Of course, it's more difficult than the previous ones, but it's the same concept. Pick the boost pads that won't get you killed and try to avoid a game over. Oh dear, this looks very similar to a level I was struggling with for a while, doesn't it? This is Flaming Passion, and this level is 
completely fine. No monkey bars to worry about this time. There's a couple of crates here that will keep floating upwards forever if you wait around long enough. That's the only time I've seen this happen outside a bonus round. If they happen to be in your way when you get here, you can take care of them with the bazooka. Alternatively, just stand still until they've disappeared off screen. Maybe if you leave them for long enough, you'll see them appearing in the next level, because Mad Bombers is another flying level. Different targets this time, but the way the nitros work is exactly the same. You can shoot them or crash into them and they won't kill you, and sometimes they'll give you extra health. So definitely no problems here. And then, have you been keeping count of the crystals? Because this is the final level, Bug Light. This is the same kind of thing that happened with Crash 2. Biggest problems I had with this game were in the middle rather than at the end. The last walkthrough kind of just flies by, even though only one of the levels is about flying. What I find particularly interesting about Crash 3 though is that you can actually beat every level in this final warp room without the bazooka. There are points in this level where it's easier to use it than to use the body slam because you need to keep up with the firefly and not dawdle too much but it's never the only way to get past anything and so that in turn means that it is possible to beat the whole game without ever using the bazooka. I did rely on it at one point sure and I did break the game in order to use it where I did, but I've seen that there is a chance you won't need it there. I thought the bazooka would be integral to this challenge, but in the end it was the supercharged body slam that I found more helpful. And I expected that the complete lack of Aku Aku protection would be much more of an issue than it was. Normally in this level, they give you three masks in one go, so you can blast through loads of nitros while you're invincible, but even here, you don't ever need any extra hit points. And so that's 25 crystals all successfully collected. All that's left to do is beat the final boss, and it does become more difficult if you swap out the explosives in that level for nitros. But those explosives were never crates in the first place, so that's beyond the scope of this challenge. I do think it's fitting though that pretty much the only appearance Aku Aku's made in this playthrough is here, where he will kill you if you go near him. But once you defeat Cortex and pick up that final superpower, that is the end of the game. And so, can you beat Crash Bandicoot Warped. if every crate is a nitro? Yes! Do you have to cheat slightly to do it? Not necessarily, but yeah, I, I am surprised that it wasn't more complicated than it turned out to be. I knew that the superpowers would be helpful, but there's so many gimmicky levels in this game where the powers are irrelevant. I was sure there had to be something that was going to make this impossible. I mean, looking at the successor to this game, the Wrath of Cortex, I really don't think you can even get as far as the first superpower. Which is funny because the sole purpose of that power is to let you safely walk on top of nitro crates specifically. Sole purpose? Do you, do you get it? So this nitro experiment that I did with Crash 2 and now Crash 3 has got me thinking a lot more about the level design in these games and especially the use of crates. Take the swimming levels as an example. There are boxes that you can't possibly avoid there, but only in areas where you're given a vehicle that can blast through them. Maybe that's just a coincidence, but when you try this kind of thing with the other games and find so many roadblocks so early on, maybe there was something deliberate about it. Maybe, over the course of three games, Naughty Dog developed a particular philosophy of Crash Bandicoot level design that none of the later developers stuck with. Either way, I think if you wanted to try this with another game, you'd have to do something a bit different and maybe just try to figure out which levels are beatable and which aren't. And yes, I know some of these games have certain exploits that mean you can skip most, if not all of the game. Even Crash 4 originally had a trick where you could just plug in a keyboard and keep pressing F and the game would gradually just complete itself, but where's the fun in skipping the whole game? I think it could be kind of interesting to explore the unique challenges that are created by different approaches to level design and gameplay mechanics that were used throughout the series by different studios. Although maybe there's one game where it might be sensible to not replace all the checkpoints with nitro crates. Oops.